Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson. Our topic today is the Eastern Hemlock Tree and with us is forest entomologist, Dr. Liu from the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Hello and thank you for joining us today. Hello oh, Beth, thank you for having me. Hello everyone, thank you for spending your lunchtime with us. <laughs> Sorry about the masking. I, I think I got a cold, but don't just don't want to alert other people by my occasional coughing. So <laughs> if that happens, I apologize. Well, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Sure. As, as, as Beth mentioned, my name is Hope Ping Liu. I'm the forest entomologist at the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. I joined the department in 2008. Since then, I hope I hope in developing uh, and implementing different kinds of forest health projects in the survey detection and the management of the invasive species as well as some of the native species. Some examples like the uh, sponge moth, the Asian longhorn beetle, the emerald ash borer, and of course the hemlock woody dodge. So my background, my study edu education is in, is, in, is in the biology and the management of forest and agriculture tasks and based on biology control and, the, and the chemical control. My current research project focuses on the nature enemies and the biology of the spotted lanternfly. Well, we're gonna talk today about a tree that's important to Pennsylvania, and you're gonna help us understand what's happening with that tree. Um, on June 22nd, 1931, the Eastern Hemlock Tree was adopted as the official state tree of Pennsylvania. And this tree is a native tree and it's been part of the forest of Pennsylvania until the introduction of some invasive species, which caused significant hemlock defoliation and mortality, which is part of today's program. Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, Today I'm going to talk about Eastern Hemlock Conservation in Pennsylvania and uh, what happened right now and what's the future directions I think we should take what will happen. So as, as you may all know, the Eastern Hemlock Sugia canadensis is a native species to Eastern United States. It was designated as a state tree for Pennsylvania in 1931. It's a long living tree, can live up to 500 years, and with a, with a height of over 30 meters and diameter of over 1.5 meters. It is a very uh, sh shade tolerant species. So normally you will find, you will not find most of them, ex except in the landscape scenario, you're not going to find in open spaces in the forest. So normally it's in a shady place. So it is a very common lens, landscape species with over uh, 300 cultivars. As a native species, Eastern hemlock can be found from Maine to south to Georgia and west to Michigan. So in Pennsylvania, this tree species can be found across the state, except the coastal plain, the Piedmont, and the southern mountains. It is especially abundant in ridges and valleys in the central area and in the Pocono and Allegheny Plateau. So just to put in a, in a bigger picture, there are 10 species of hemlock around the world including uh, six in Asia and four in North America. In Asia, there's uh, two species in Japan, one in the South, one in the North, and three species in China. And in 2017, researchers actually found a new species in Korea called uh, Yulin. It's only found in Yulin Island of, of the Korean uh, Peninsula. In North America, there are two species that we found in the West, like Washington State. Uh, there's a Western hemlock, the mountain hemlock. And in our area, 
uh, in the eastern part is like eastern hemlock, of course, and the Carolina hemlock, which is only found in the in the Carolinas. So today I, we are going to focus on the eastern hemlock. Eastern hemlock is a very important tree uh, throughout the American history. Uh, during during the industrial period, it was used for the tannery. Uh, the wood can be used for cabins, but its bark is most useful uh, during that period of time. And this is just one picture from New York when the workers uh, chopped on the tree and peeled the bark and transport them to the tanneries. And just like uh, from a historical point of view, just want to know, let you know that there are massive, massive operations during that point in time. For example, in the Catskins regions of New York, at one point, there's as many as 64 tanneries. And they estimated about 70 million trees were cut for the bark. Here's a picture from the state archive. Say the same thing happens in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania as well. But I just don't have the numbers of how many tanneries or how many trees were cut. Were cut. So in addition to the uh, economics, you know, for the uh, for the uh, hemlock trees, it, it is very important ecological species, which can provide food, shelter, and uh, habitats for a lot of uh, animals and and uh, and birds species. This is just a few examples of that. More importantly, it actually shade the uh, stream habitat because the hemlocks uh, are very good species in their pairing areas and which can keep the uh, streams and rivers cool. The temperature in those rivers on the, and uh, creeks are much lower than, than the, uh, say, the, uh, another stream that don't have this coverage. So this is important because our state fish, brook trout, depends on those cold streams to survive. So if the hemlocks are destroyed or, or changed to other species, it's most likely the brook trout will be in danger as well. So it is a very important ecological species. So, and it, right now, like a hundred years after the industrial revolution, the threat for the hemlock tree is not from the uh, uh, tanneries or, or, or other, other things, but from this tiny invasive species called hemlock woody adagis tsugi. It is a very small uh, insect, about 1.5 millimeter long, native to, to Japan and China. It feeds on the xyron parenchyma cells, uses long uh, mouth part. This is the piercing sucking mouth part. It's about like three times of the body length. And most likely we can see in the field because the uh, eggs and the limbs are kind of small for untrained eyes, but most people will see the uh, uh, adults that are covered with white wax, like a, always, we call it always sex. And inside there'll be, there'll be the female, there'll be the eggs uh, if you open them up. But this life cycle it has three generations per year. There's a winter generation we call assistance from June, July to March of next year. There's also the uh, spring generation we call progredients from April to June. And there's also a sexual, those two generations are asexual generations because they don't need, uh, females don't need to mate to produce eggs. But there is a sexual uh, generation in Asia 
called Shakespeare, and in, in North America as well. But that generation in North America cannot produce because they don't have the appropriate host trees because they, they need to use, in Asia, it need to use a species called a tiger uh, spruce. We don't have it here. So most like, you know, like a, in our area, we don't have to worry about the sex pair because they have wings, they can fly away to disperse further, further away. I can mention that, I'll mention that a little bit later. Uh, the, the nymphs pass through four in star and the cistins chlorus, which hatches like in June, uh, July, as the first in start, they don't, they settle at the knee, base of the needle, hemlock needles, they don't feed, they enter this uh, uh, period called estivation. They will stay there until like late Aug October because of high temperature, they are not gonna uh, do anything until late October and they resume feeding and then start to mold and become uh, uh, adult again and then they eggs. So that, that's when you see the, uh, wet, uh, the wax on the uh, OSX. So the introduction history, actually the uh, two, Two populations in North America. The populations in Western uh, North America, in British Columbia, in Oregon, actually they were more closely related to the Japanese. Uh, is, is is different than the ones introduced uh, to uh, Virginia in 1951. So those ones from the West do not kill healthy trees which they think is a co evolved with the host for a hundred, you know, thousands of years. But the ones found in the uh, East actually kill healthy trees. That's when the problems comes. So it was believed this originated from Southern Ch Japan. It's not from the uh, same, uh, it's not the same, uh, you know, origin compared to the uh, Western population. So this is a map, this is a map of the hemlock weed dog in 2021. And you can, as you can see, most of the uh, uh, range, native range of the hemlocks are infested, except the ones in the Northern part of, this, of, 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 the, of the map. So in total is include like 20 states, can be found in 20 states in the U.S. and two provinces in Canada. In, and in uh, Pennsylvania, although this map shows there are three counties not infested, but unfortunately two of them already uh, infested in 2022. So the only ones not infested right now is Crawford County. So in terms of signs and symptoms for the uh, uh, infestation, at the beginning, you will see the hemlocks don't have, don't put up new growth as usual. And then you will see some crown thinnings because the needles drop uh, because of the uh, feeding and crown dieback. And in terms of the insect itself, you will see those uh, uh, OSX and you saw, if, you know, if you inspect closely, you will see some of the life stages like the eggs and the nymphs. Of course, obviously, for most people, when you see dead trees, you know this is something was wrong with this uh, with this tree, and uh, something caused the mortality. So, in terms of uh, management options, there are different types of management options you can take: the power spray with horticultural oil and six of soap, the chemical control you can inject uh, the chemicals to the soil or to the trunk. And it's a biology control. You, uh, you can introduce some natural enemies that's lacking in our, in our area, but it's uh, uh, found in the uh, origin, origin, original uh, range, like in uh, Western US or in China or in Japan. And you can also do some silviculture, silviculture like the uh, thinning, like uh, and maybe to prepare for the worst, to do some seed collection. 
And also we do some research on the resistant breeding. So I'll, I'll cover this one by one very briefly. So for the cover spray, it's good because it's non-toxic and, and it's a kill by smothering because the uh, insect, as I showed you, they have the wax cover. So the soap can loosen up the wax and then the insect will, will die by dehydration. And normally you need to cover the entire tree and you can do it from March to April or August to uh, October. And uh, you do not want to do it if the tree is in, uh, in the growing season or very high temperature over 75 degrees Fahrenheit or lo very low temp temperature, lower than 45 you know, degrees you know, Fahrenheit because to avoid phototoxicity. The soil treatment, you can, you can do it like some of the uh, uh, egg stores, you can buy some of the over-the-counter product, you can do the soil drench. And uh, you, so for professional use, you can do the injectors, buy the injector, the curious injector, this is one of them. And there's new, as in relatively new, there's a, a contact tablet. You can use the, like a plunger to plunger them in, into the soil. So, so remember when you do that, you need to remove the organic layer on, on the ground because the, uh, some of the chemicals, especially the metacopa, they bound, bound, uh, bind with the, uh, with the uh, organic material. So it will prevent them from getting translocated through the tree. And then throughout the year, there are different types of trunk injection you can do. Trunk injection normally used when you have a situation like, in, like the tree is very close to the stream. So you don't want to get the chemicals in the soil, which has a potential to leak to the water system. So that's when you need a, a trunk injection. So there, there are different types of trunk injectors, like this uh, pressurized uh, capsules or, or injection gun or the IV system. This is the pressurized uh, capsules, this is inject gun, and this is the IV system you can use. You basically need, for those IV system, you need to drill holes and uh, plug a plug. Sometimes some of them don't have a plug system. So you need those, it's more complicated. So most likely as homeowner, you cannot use this kind of method. The uh, equipment itself is very expensive. So in terms of the uh, chemicals you can use for the uh, trunk injection, both the metacorporate and you know, tafferin can be, uh, can be used in this kind of system. And the basal spray, uh, they can only be used for, uh, I think only used for the uh, denoterafrin because it's, it's very uh, water soluble. So it's, it has good uh, speed of translocating throughout the tree. So you just need to use the backpack sprayer, mix the chemicals and the spray a section of the trunk. And uh, the chemicals can be found like it's in the couple of weeks can be found on the forage itself. So. In terms of biology control, there are lots of uh, uh, scientists started looking for natural enemies in China, in Japan. I think first in Japan in, in the 1990s. And they found this uh, beetle called Sasaji scumus tugi in Japan and was introduced to uh, US in 1994. Release started in 1995 in Connecticut. And because they uh, have two generations a year and synchronized well with the uh, hemlock woody adulge, adulge life cycle, and it's easy to rear. So the millions of them were released in many, many, uh, I think 16 or 15 or 16 states. And uh, we help, you know, with the help that it can control the uh, Hemlock would indulge the population in the field. But unfortunately, after medians released the uh, recovery, which you know we go we do that as a researcher, you go after one or two years, two years of release, you go back to the tree to see whether you can find them. If you find them, it means they uh, survived the uh, winter and they started to uh, reproduce. That's a good sign. So 
Unfortunately, the recovery rate was very low. We don't know exactly what happens. You know, the first year was good, and the second year less, and the third year almost uh, disappeared. So we didn't know what's happened. And most of the releases in Pennsylvania for this species happens in the Delaware water gap. And there are also a couple of uh, small beetles uh, from China. This is Scumus and Nishiansis, which has, uh, you know, one year generation preferred the hemlock really dodge it. And it's two more, Scumus uh, Sinodernus and Scumus Camptodromus. There are also uh, three species we tried from China. And there's another one, Schemus coniferus, is native to the Western US, was also tested, mixed results. After this uh, Schemus, we will focus on the Alaricobis nigrinus. This one is from uh, British Columbia in the 1990s, was introduced to the Eastern US in 1997. Release uh, began in 2001, Virginia. This one has one generation and both adult, you know, larvae, uh, not, not uh, larvae feed on the uh, adults feed on all hemlock with adult at stages and larvae feed on the eggs. So it should be a nice uh, candidate. The only downside is uh, after the release, people find they hybridize, hybridize with a native species called the Aricobis uh, rubicus. Another Laricobis species called Laricobis osecensis. This was this one was found in Japan because uh, a later study shows that the hemlock woody dodger actually is originated from southern Japan. So it makes sense to find some nature enemies in, in that area. That was introduced to US in 2006. And after the e environmental evaluation, and it was released a few years later, and it has a similar uh, characteristics with the uh, uh, the granites, but it also had a similar problem because they also hybridized with the rubidus. Most recently, try studies focus on two species of silver fly, uh, Leucotacris argentine argentine colors, and the uh, Leucotaris. Guitarist uh, peanut powder. So the study is ongoing right now. People are doing the lab evaluation and the field cake study. So in terms of hemlock, we started to monitor hemlocks since 2004. Uh, Use the survey on a, at a, a township level with the GIS. We have more than 10,000 sites surveyed throughout the years which include a fewer variation of uh, 10, bran 10 branches per tree and 10 trees per site. If you look at the uh, uh, hemorrhoid wooded out and other stressors, and we record the uh, health of the tree and the amount of new growth and use that information to prioritize areas for hemlock conservation. We also drafted a chem uh, conservation plan which focuses on high priorities, high priority forests and ecological areas and watershed stream habit, habitat to protect high value trees through chemical control or biological control. In addition, we also participated in the seed collection and ex, ex situ conservation and resistance breeding. And, and uh, we also uh, count the other impact of the other stressors, which I can mention, I will mention a few later. So, so the, uh, four, uh, there are five uh, high priority forests in the uh, state we identify. One is Cook Forest State Park in the Crean Forest and Jefferson County. And another one is Taunista Sci Scientific Area, which is an uh, Allegheny National Forest in uh, Aurora, or in the McKean County. And this Snyder uh, Middlesworth National Area in Snyder County and Bear Meadows Natural Area in Central County and Arlene Seeger Natural Areas in uh, Huntington County. 
In terms of ecological important areas, we identified 36 uh, statewide, and most of them found in our Lower Sox State Forest at 24, and a few in the Sprawl and Tuscarora, Montana, Delaware, and Michelle State Forest. So in terms of seed collecting and exit uh, conservation, we worked with North, North Carolina State University, and they uh, collected seeds from the range of the uh, hemlock distribution range, and they actually have a seed orchard on campus to produce those uh, seedlings, and then they actually have a cooperation in Brazil and other uh, South American countries, just plant those trees just in case for, you know, we ever need some uh, seed from the hemlocks, especially for the Carolina hemlock. Resistant breeding, and is a few years ago, researchers found some uh, resistance Temporary. I think it's, uh, we are not so sure right now whether they are resistant, but at least those trees survived well in a heavily infested area. So they, uh, researchers from University of Rhode Island, they did some uh, cuttings and they pro propagated some seedlings and, and they try to uh, plant them in different states to see whether they are actually resistant to the hemlock without it. We are part of the study. And we planted some in uh, wildfire uh, state forest, and we and the, the follow up evaluation found actually they are they are look they look very promising at this point. In terms of chemical treatment, we've been treating uh, with the metacobalamin and Danish heparin since 2010. This is just the list of trees, how many trees we treat each year. Uh, tens of thousands of trees treated each year. And this one, I just want to show you the 2008. It's like almost like 16,000 treated by Medicorporate alone. And those accounted for uh, tens of thousands of uh, like, uh, we use the uh, DBH diameter at breast height in inches. We also released most of the Paris toys I mentioned in, in the previous slides. And uh, this is just uh, for the past uh, six years, five years. And uh, we released the Lenticobis Ningralis, Lenticobis Osigensis, and uh, those two superfly species we released in 2021. So this is a map showing the locations of where we did our chemical treatment, where we did our predator release. This is just the, uh, all the locations. So now I just want to mention a few other stresses. Hemlock wooded dodge is not only one feed on the hemlocks. So this one is the elongated hemlock scale. It's feed on hemlocks and spruce fern, it's all winter eggs. Uh, the males and male, females can be separated by the color of the wax cover. They have uh, uh, three installs for females and five installs for males. <clears throat> and we did participate, uh, this one predator was released for the control of this uh, insect. Cybocephalus and impolicus. And this, this one is like called hemlock looper. It's also, it's also a hemlock and a balsam fir, white spruce, and uh, the old winter is eggs because it's a moth. And the larvae feed on forage by nipping. So if you, if you're traveling, if you're going through the woods and you see lots of uh, clipped needles accumulate, you can take a look whether you, whether this is a cause by the hemlock loop. Hemlock ball, this one is feeding inside the wood and they lay eggs in the bark crevices or winter is larvae and larvae turn us in the sapwood and all can be uh, distinguished by the yellow spot on the elytra, the, the hind wings. There are also a couple of other uh, uh, diseases, the fibrin needle bright, causes fungus. 
which sometimes could also uh, harm the health of Hemlock. So that's, I think, what I, all I have for today. I know it's, uh, it's a lot of information. I have to pack a lot of in. So, uh, so you're welcome to shoot me an email if you have any questions. And for the conservation of hemlocks in Pennsylvania, you can visit, visit our uh, department website, which is uh, uh, listed here. And uh, thank you. I'll turn back to Beth. All right, thank you. If you wanna go ahead and turn your camera back on so everybody can see you. We do have several questions. One we're gonna start with is just a clarification. Is a hemlock tree an evergreen tree? Yes. And what would make it an evergreen tree? What are the qualifications? Yeah, well, evergreen trees will not shed their leaves during the winter. So does this make the tree, does this make hemlocks more susceptible to infestations because they're... Not really, because most of the insects don't feed during the winter. Hemlock weed dog is uh, kind of like exception because most of the insects don't feed during the winter. They are all winter. This one, <laughs> this one actually needs the cold. As I mentioned, the uh, the uh, first thing start noon, the estuaries and in July, they don't feed because high temperature actually makes them inactive, but they need the cold temperature to start. Okay, Stop so the cold, mm -hmm. the cold temperature helps them. Mm -hmm. How how do they spread? Are they carried by animals? Do they blow in the wind? How yes, how they, they are. They are actually uh, humans. Humans is one of the <laughs> one of the uh, beauty parts to start with. I think it is believed that the, this pest was first introduced to uh, Virginia from Japan by infested seedlings. So. Definitely, that's a long distance. Uh, long distance wise, is the human, you know. Uh, short distance, of course, the uh, wind, uh, birds, animals. So I think somebody did some research that the they find the uh, infestation find like at 600 meters from the uh, from the original one, wow. and which you believe to be airborne, and also over 80 percent of birds. Have near the infested hemlock have eggs or or crawlers with the first, you know the uh, first thing starts on them. Deers also can also can carry those eggs and the crawlers and they if they browse on the infested hemlock. And in terms of spread speed, uh, it spreads faster in the south. It's about estimate about fifty kilometers per year in the south, about eight kilometers in the north. Wow. Well, we have a couple questions about um, tree species. One of the listeners is from the Morris Ar Arboretum in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and they have a mature tiger spruce in the garden. Should they be mm -hmm. concerned about that? Uh, tiger spruce, I don't think is <sighs> yes or sure or no. Depends. Because if you're concerned about tiger spruce, I don't think the hemlock we thought we will do too much damage on them because they used it as a, a breeding site for the generation. They were back to the hemlock again. But if you're concerned about the hemlock, yes, because you, then you have another generation to consider. That's what happens in Asia. They have three generations. And also from the dispersed point of view, because the sex parrots, they have wings, they can fly. So they will help with tiger spruce. They, they can will help them to spread further. That is the concern. So is there a difference between the Carolina species of hemlock and the eastern hemlock as far as infestation? Is one pre preferred or are they uh, affected equally? Uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't have Carolina, Carolina uh, hemlocks in Pennsylvania. So I don't know on first hand, but from what I heard from other researchers in the South, they actually they are more damaging to the uh, to the Carolina uh, hemlock. I don't have my uh, first hand uh, you know information on that, but 
But I think it's safe to say they're both vulnerable, very vulnerable to the Helmholtz grid out there. We have a lot of questions regarding from homeowners regarding hemlocks in their yard. Mm -hmm. um, someone has, they've paid for spraying nearly every year and it seems to be helping, but it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Are there op other options that they could do that would be as effective at a lower cost? Uh, depends on what kind of uh, spray they have. If, you know, if I can understand the only uh, spray they can use is the, uh, would be the uh, insecticidal soap or some of the organic oil, right? So yes, that actually going to be expensive. But but it, the good news about the chemical control, if you don't do the spray, you you stay in medical operate from uh, either soil drench by yourself or injection. So you think by a professional pesticide user, applicator. It can last five, at least for five years. So we have the, we had the uh, data to show like in, uh, in state forest, state parks, if you apply them in, uh, in, uh, in the ground near the tree or at the base of the tree, it can last for five years. The downside is that the medical blade moves very slow in, inside the tree. It takes about a year before the chemicals reach to the top of the tree. So if you want to do that, need to plan ahead, like don't wait until the tree looks really bad because it takes time for the chemicals to get up. On the other side, the dinotrafurin, they move really fast. Like one to two weeks, you can have the chemicals on top of the tree, but the uh, efficacy, you know, it's like any, it only lasts for like, uh, for like one or two years. So, so basically, I, I think, you know, Especially for homeowners, if you have a, you know, only a couple of trees, I think you should be able to build with the soil drench method with the made culprit, and it should be able to protect your tree. Should they only treat trees that are obviously infected, or should infected, or should they be doing preventative measures on on trees that look healthy? Well, in, in our business, we always have to say you need to monitor the population before you uh, start any management option because you need to know what you are dealing with before you spend the money and time. In terms of the preventative, personally, I don't think you need to do that unless unless you have the resources to say, hey, I want to, I want to, you know, my neighbors has it or or like my next door neighbor next, you know, on the next street has it, I, I, I need to worry about. But, but also uh, another thing you need to think about is like for the, if you choose the medical grid, keep in mind it takes time for the chemicals to translocate. So you, you, you do need to go ahead like a little bit earlier, but not necessarily like say, if you, you, you even don't have the sensation uh, like 10 miles, five miles from your property. I think that's like a specific location. You need to check whether you have infestations nearby or we have infestations on your tree. I don't sure. know whether I answered the question for you. <laughs> no, no, I think I, I think so. I, I, I you know, it, it, seem, it would seem that each area you kind of have to establish how, what, where the infestation is, how, um, widespread it is at what stage it's kind of at to know exactly what to do. Yeah, yeah, because because uh, we had a, a similar situation with the uh, Emerald Ash Bowl, and uh, their recommendation for uh, the Emerald Ash Bowl treatment is like if you don't have known infestation in 15, 15 miles, then you don't have to do anything yet. Um, but I don't know whether this is a priority the animals would I doubt I doubt we are priority. You know, different insects, different. But as I said, you don't need to be panicked if if you 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 only have one insect like uh, thirty miles from you. But but also, but unfortunately though, for for the insects, it's really hard if, to know if you don't do the monitor. So I suggest if you have a, a couple of trees, just just monitor them. You know, for the leaves and the health, like as we always do, to see whether you have infestation. So the yeah. initial infestation is always light. So I think by the time you find the initial infestation, it's not too late to treat. You can still do it. 
That makes that makes sense. Um, question on insecticidal soap. How often should it be used as a preventative, or do you, should it only be used when you see an infestation? Uh, yeah, I th I think so to to save save your time and money. I don't think you need to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, we have a lot more questions here. So um, who's winning? Are the hemlock trees winning or are the adelgid infestations winning at this point? Uh, definitely the adelgid at this point. As I said, you know, we try our best to, to save as many trees as possible, but the number of trees you can save actually is uh, very limited. Even like in those like uh, priority areas, like in the cook forest, you just can't save every single tree, you know, it's too big and, uh, and, uh, and the resources, nobody has the unlimited resources. So you sometimes see, you know, it's, uh, it's a hard decision. It's a very difficult decision to say, yeah, we are going to save hemlocks on this, in this uh, part of, you know, uh, part, but not on the other part. <laughs> so it's yeah. really hard to do. <laughs> yeah. I think, unfortunately, the uh, looks like the hemlock is it really dodge is winning because every year we have more trees dying. Unfortunately, which is not good. So I, I think you just answered the next question, which is what degree of natural resistance is being observed? I'm gathering at this point really none. Yeah, yeah. There are people, there are researchers do and try to get the hybrid between the Chinese and the, and the Eastern hemlock. And also, as I mentioned in one slide, the uh, some like uh, wild trees shows shows like a little bit the ability to survive better. So we're hoping that's caused by the resistance, but we are not sure at this point. More so, research is needed. Yeah. Since I, you know, we live in an age now where we're doing where the general public is has been helping out a lot of areas with research and reporting. Is there a hotline or a resource to report infestations? Is, is there anybody collecting uh, that kind of information? Normally, we do that as a state agency. We do that when the uh, infestation was just started. But now, as I showed you on one of the maps, we have 66 or 67 counties already <laughs> under infestation. Unless you live in Craw uh, Crawford, Crawford County, then we want to hear from you the new infestation because of your county. Normally, what happens like in the uh, uh, quarantine, in the management system is that if we find some, I think it used to be like three infestation in the county, we all declare the county is like, oh, I think the even just one infestation. Uh, keep in mind, just because the, your county's map is infested doesn't mean every corner in your county is infested. It could mean just one infestation somewhere, which relates back to the management. Uh, management strategy. So if you have like just a newly infested, maybe your tree is not infected just because somebody else in the other corner of the county is infected. Yes, yeah, so we still want to hear from you, but we don't have a, a website or something to report a new infestation, but, it, but you're welcome to contact me and our department to report any damage or something like that or infestation. As I said, just because your county is infected it doesn't mean we have the infestation in your area. I, I have a feeling you're going to get a lot of contacts. So. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, let's see. Do um, is there a best time of year to do the soil drench as a home? Yeah, soil drench. Oh, we yeah. normally or is that do. Like, you consult with a professional on what to do. Yes, yes. Ask if you ask. If, you know, if you do it at home, uh, best choice maybe to check with the arborist or what is it called professional applicator. And uh, what we do, we normally do in the fall, we do some in the spring also. I think I think as long as the soil uh, is not frozen and the tree, because the point of the injection or soil drench is to make the chemicals, make the trees take the chemical from the soil. So just think about that. If the tree shuts down, then, then it's not good. That does not just mean winter, but it also means like a summer in the very hot times because you don't want to do that because the tree basically shuts itself down to protect itself. So except for like a cold winter or like very hot summer, 
month, I think you can do that. You know, in the fall, most of the good times in the, in the fall in the spring. So we're going to get to our last audience question, which is a very good one, and it's one that I have as well. Do you recommend planting trees in areas where hemlocks have have died? And if so, what trees are best? So I guess the question is, is there any damage to that soil or that area? And is it okay to plant other trees? Uh, I would like you to plant another hemlock just because the uh, <laughs> habitat is so important to a lot of other uh, species. So we want to maintain the you know, hemlock habitat. Uh, in terms of other species, I, I don't really, because I'm not a really tree guy, <laughs> I don't really have a species for you to say. Maybe uh, maybe like a, a white pine or something like that is similar. But I really want you to keep the hemlocks going. Even, even the old, you know, old ones are die, uh, dead or dying. Would there be anything to do to the soil area to remove any residual woolly adelgid in the area or will they go away when the tree goes away? They will go away when the tree goes away, definitely. They okay. specialize on hemlock. Okay. But in terms of soil, I think, you know, anytime, unfortunately, if you have an empty space in the woods, most likely the under the invasive plants will take over like Japanese steel grass or, <laughs> or other things. So that's why we don't want to have like empty, empty spaces in the woods just because uh, the that's cause you know invasive uh, invasive plants is another headache. Well, this has been great. I want to thank the audience for your questions. If you want to explore more about this topic, you can visit the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources website or the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website. The links are in the chat box as well as an email to contact Dr. Liu. So, Dr. Liu, what would you like the audience to remember from today's program about the Eastern hemlock tree and the hemlock woolly adelgid? Well, I think the take home message for today's presentation is number one, our beautiful state tree is threatened again. This time is only this time is by this tiny invasive pest called hemlock woolly adelgid, not by the axe. And number two, as a natural resource management agency, we are doing everything we can to protect as many trees, hemlock, ace and hemlock on the state, as well as local and private lands through chemical control, biological control, detection, uh, research, and public outreach. Number three, unfortunately, the number of trees we can, we can save currently is still very small compared to the total number of trees in the woods. And uh, another thing to, keep, to think about is the climate change actually may bring more challenges to this endeavor as it will impact the uh, old winter biology of this pest. So think about integrated pest management like when we try to incorporate the chemical control, biology control, and the civil culture control and also resistant breeding may, may offer some help in the future. And the bottom line is that we need more communities, landowners and the private citizens to join us to conserve more trees and habitats actually across the state. As I mentioned, many of these stream habitats, the watershed habitats are very important to the species. And together, I, I believe we can keep our magnificent tree for future generations to enjoy. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much for being part of this program today.